All right, let me see if I can heat the mic enough. Uh, so this is a talk that I gave at the uh, SANS Digital Forensics Incident Response Summit this summer. Uh, it's all about red teaming and, and blue teaming. Out of curiosity, uh, anybody in here doing red team, blue team engagements in your organization? I have like four or five hands, good. Anybody doing pen tests in your organization? Okay. Uh, so, in, in a few places, I've given this talk in Wisconsin and Tennessee, and in, in a few places, uh, people don't understand there's a difference between a pin test and a red team engagement. Hopefully by the end of the talk, uh, that will be somewhat clear. There's really not a good set of definitions for this stuff in the industry, but uh, hopefully, you know, I'm going to talk from my perspective and my experience, and hopefully by the end of the night, uh, we'll all come around to understand what the difference is between a pin test engagement and a red team engagement. All right. So this is a slide I showed here last summer when I was here talking about Kanza, which is an open source framework I wrote for doing security incident response work. What this slide shows is a persistence mechanism that we caught in Office 365 when I was working at Microsoft. Uh, so for those of you that don't know, Microsoft is real big on red team, blue team engagements. Uh, they were doing it the four years that I worked for Microsoft, we were continuously red teaming the service. Uh, there was a team of dedicated people trying to break into Office 365 and basically do what nation state adversaries would do. Uh, so we got word that they were in one of the environments and we did what any incident response team would do. We tried to figure out, okay, where are they? They must be trying to maintain persistence. They've got to have code running somewhere, so how do we find it? Uh, so we ran a system journals tool called this DLLs across, in this case it was about 5,000 machines, and we pulled all that data back. If you're not familiar with this DLLs, it shows you running processes and all of the DLLs that are loaded in those processes, right? So we ran this tool across 5,000 or so machines. We took that data back and we started analyzing it, and we found uh, on one machine there was a spools V process. So what you're looking at is uh, all of the schools V data from 5,000 machines shown here, these are all of the DLLs that are loaded into each of those processes. This is a tool for Mandiant called Highlighter, which is pretty nice for looking at, at files in the large. Um, so this, this black stuff off to the right side, that is like a 10,000 foot view of this file. And you can see there's one line in there that's much longer than all the others. That was a malicious DLL that the red team had loaded into this schools V process on one machine. That was how they were maintaining persistence in this particular environment. So as part of the post-mortem process, we sat down with the red team, we sat down with the stakeholders, and we presented all of our evidence. Here's what we found, here's how we found it, and Joe Bialak, who some of you may know from online circles, uh, he goes by the handle Climber, he was one of the red teamers at Microsoft. He saw this and he facepalmed, and uh, they took a bug and they went back and changed their tooling and they never made it this easy for us to find it again. So that's red team, blue team. That's how you improve uh, both teams and, and get better is by sharing what you find and how you find it. Uh, so that's a little bit of a teaser. So who am I? Uh, I've been doing information security for, I think it's a little over 10 years now. Uh, most of that time I've been doing security incident response work. I did a couple of years where I was doing application security work. Uh, but for the most part, I've been doing incident response work uh, for the last 10 years plus a little. Uh, I think it came up during this terrible time of all the wormable nastiness uh, that was affecting Microsoft operating systems. I was working at a research university down the road here, 20, 25,000 endpoints on the network. Uh, everybody's sitting on IPv4, routable addresses, no NAT, no firewalls, no AV requirements, no patching requirements. It was awesome. Uh, so we had to learn incident handling fairly quickly. Uh, after that, I, I was a, an instructor with SANS for a few years. I managed their blog and was one of the leading contributors. I've written a number of open source tools. Uh, as I mentioned, I worked for Office uh, 365 for about four years. I was the technical lead for security incident response there. While I was there, I wrote this tool called Kanza, which I talked about here last year. Today, I work for Tanium, uh, and we're in the incident response, EDR space, and systems management, and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, so this is the agenda, right? You've got a little bit of a teaser, there's been a speaker intro. Uh, the talk is primarily about red team, right? So uh, this is what we're gonna stick to. Why should you be doing red team? 
You should be doing red teaming because it delivers a security incident. Okay, and this is the, the fundamental thing with, with red teaming is it gives you an opportunity to practice how you're going to handle a security incident. Now, I don't want to offend the pen testers in the room, but contrast this with pen testing, which may deliver a nice report, right? I worked for a, a big organization here in town, a big bank that many of you have heard of, uh, and we would, once a year, we would bring in one of the big consulting firms to do a pen test engagement, and they would come in and they would meet with us, and at the end of it, we would get this giant binder of all of their findings. So that was the nice report. So you should be doing red teaming because it gives you an opportunity to play like you want to, or to practice like you want to play. So as an example of this, uh, I'll play a little sports ball clip if I can find my mouse. So this is uh, Villanova, North Carolina, national championship game last year. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with basketball, and if I can get the video to play. What you're going to see here is Chris Jenkins on the baseline is going to inbound the ball to this guy, Ryan Archie Diacono. Archie Diakono is going to dribble down to the top of the key. He's going to turn around and dish the ball back to Chris Jenkins. Jenkins takes the last second shot at the buzzer, and they win the game. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, I'm not just showing you this because I want to see North Carolina lose this game over and over and over again. Yeah. Um, although, you know, it has given me great pleasure to watch this video probably 50 times now. Uh, I'm not just showing you that. I'm showing you th for that reason. I'm showing you this because uh, the next day I was reading about the game in the paper, and Phil Booth, one of the players on Villanova's team, said, we run that play at the end of every practice. So you think about that. You know, you've, you've been in a college basketball practice. I, I've never played college ball, but I have to imagine those guys probably practice for an hour, maybe two hours a day. It's got to be physically and mentally exhausting. And now at the end of practice, they've got to run through this stupid play that they run through at the end of every single practice. Well, that gives them an opportunity to develop muscle memory. And by doing red team engagements and keeping your incident response team engaged and having to deal with security incidents, uh, it gives you an opportunity to develop muscle memory as an incident response team. Uh, if that's not a compelling enough reason, maybe this is. Uh, you should be doing red teaming because it gives you quantifiable results. Red teaming, unlike real security incidents, is quantifiable. You can actually determine over a period of time, how long does it take approximately for our organization to get compromised? If you know the date that the red team starts the engagement and when they actually break into the service, then over time, doing this over a four year period, we were able to get to a pretty reasonable degree of confidence about what the mean time to compromise was for the service. You can also figure out mean time to detection. You know, a lot of organizations read the, the Veris report, or the, uh, uh, Verizon. The, the Verizon report, I always get those two mixed up. Read the Verizon report. You know, they talk about these organizations being compromised for months or years. I think we're down to months now, but for a while it was years uh, before they recognized that they were compromised. How do you develop a meaningful metric about, around mean time to detection if the compromise has been going on for months or years? It's hard to do, but if you're doing a red team exercise, you know when they started, you know when they got in, you know how long it took to detect, you can build out meaningful data for this. You can also accurately figure out what your mean time to recovery is. So those are the top two reasons in my mind for doing red teaming as a regular part of your security program. All right, so that covers the why of red teaming. So what is red teaming exactly? Uh, I think for me, maybe it's easiest to define red teaming by what it isn't. So let's talk about some of the things it isn't. Uh, it's not a vulnerability assessment. Or I'm sorry, it's, I'm reading the slide ahead here. It's not a threat model. Uh, so threat modeling is an important part of any security program. You should have it. Uh, this is, you know, Microsoft is big on this. When they're developing a new service or a new program, they sit down and they try to figure out what are all the ways this thing could break, what are all the places we could be attacked, and how do we build in mitigations into the design of this thing from the get-go. That's threat modeling. Your red teamers can help you do threat modeling, but that is not what red teaming is about. It's not a vulnerability assessment. Uh, there's lots of great things you can do with vulnerability assessment, you know, scan your network, figure out what your vulnerabilities are, identify and prioritize those things and get them cleaned up. Your red team can help with that, but that is not what um, red teaming is. It's not penetration testing. I mentioned, you know, we would hire this big four consulting firm to come in and do an annual pen test when I was working uh, for a bank here in town. And they would come in and they would sit down with us, they would talk to us about what it was, you know, what do you want to get out of this pen test? 
Um, these are the, uh, the hours of operation. We're going to work 9 to 5. We're going to work from these IP ranges. Please set exceptions in the firewall for us. If you've got a web application firewall, we're going to use this as our browser user agent string. Uh, please set exceptions in the web application firewall. If we trigger alarms or you know, if we do something bad, give us a call, let us know. Don't mess with us. Uh, that is, for the most part, how penetration tests work. Now, some pen testers in here are going to shake their heads and say, well, that's not how we do it. And I've, I've actually met with a couple of teams that do real red team engagements. Um, I, I dis distinguish between what's a pen test and what's a red team engagement by if, if you're a pen tester and you're telling your customers, hey, if you want to try and stop us, try and stop us, that you've crossed the line into a red team engagement at that point. That's how I define it. Uh, and that's just, there's no great industry definition of the terms here, but that's uh, how I like to look at it. So red teaming is different than a pen test. Some people in the industry are calling it adversary emulation. Some people call it force-on-force -force engagement. Typically, the people that are ex-military, they like to refer to it as force-on-force -force engagement. Um, red teams have mission objectives. Some people look at red teams and they think, well, enterprise or domain admin, that's the mission objective. That is actually uh, kind of a means to an end, not the, uh, not the end in itself. Uh, ultimately, they want to do something like a customer pivot. So for an online service, if you have a customer portal, your customers can sign in with their credentials. If they can get from their stuff to some other customer's stuff, that's a customer pivot. This is the kind of thing we look for all the time at O365. IP theft is another red team objective that's fairly common, fairly self-explanatory, so I won't belabor it. Uh, burn it all down. This is my favorite scenario uh, that I think it's just a fun one. Burn it all down scenarios like Saudi Aramco or Sony Pictures. If your red team can get unauthorized code running on every endpoint in your network, innocuous unauthorized code, code that, you know, they just show that it ran. They don't necessarily have to wipe hard drives. Uh, that would be bad. Um, but burn it all down is a relatively fun scenario. You should try that in your organization. Uh, ultimately, red teams have a mission objective, and the objective ultimately should be to test the incident response capabilities and procedures of the entire organization, not just of the blue team. Okay, this is where this is another thing about red teaming. It gives you an opportunity to let the entire organization, uh, everybody that needs to be involved in an incident, uh, should be involved. So, what do I mean by that? Well, imagine uh, you're like a lot of companies, and Brian Krebs is your IDS. You, know, you come in and you're reading the security blog and you see your company's name on Brian Krebs' website you've got a security incident. If Brian Krebs is your IDS, who do you think responds to the security incident? Is it just the security team? You're going to have legal, you're going to have communications, you're going to have a ton of managers involved, you're going to have subject matter experts from around the company involved. It won't just be a handful of people in the incident response team. So a red team engagement should give you an opportunity to see how those different teams play together and how those pieces all fit together and what the lines of communications are. Uh, so take advantage of that when you're running a red team engagement. So some highlights and lessons learned uh, from my own experience in this fun field. Uh, so one is outliers may be leads. I think it was Prior to 2009, before I ever heard like formal language about least frequency of occurrence uh, being bandied about in terms of incident response and, and its usefulness uh, for IR, uh, but we were pursuing and looking at outliers for a long time before I ever heard this formalized. I think it was uh, Peter Silverman of Mandiant who wrote a blog post about least frequency analysis and using it for security incident response. So outliers may be leads. Very useful tool. Here's an example of an outlier that's a lead. Here's another slide I showed when I was here talking about cons of last year. This is a WMI event consumer that we collected in Office 365 in response to another red team engagement. The top line here, you'll notice, so these are hosts where we collect data from. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Uh, but you, obviously, the top one here is different. It's an outlier. The dates are different. The size of the file is different. Uh, so another case where outliers may be leads. So I don't, I don't want to belittle outliers as a useful technique, but I think it's been oversold a little bit. Anybody know who this guy is? Dan Gear. Dan Gear. Wow. First, first audience where somebody's actually shouted out the name. Most people have no idea who this guy is. You should know who this guy is. He's one of the luminaries from our industry. He's one of my favorite people in the industry. 
Uh, he believes that we have probably the most intellectually challenging job of our time. Uh, I happen to think he's right, uh, you know, for selfish reasons. But Dan Gear is a really, really smart guy. Uh, he wrote this paper in early 2000 time frame, I think it was. Uh, he worked for a company called At State, which is a big uh, consulting firm. I think they, they got acquired eventually by somebody else. But they did a lot of uh, consulting for Microsoft, specifically in application security. So they were working on making the next version of Windows more secure and Windows or Microsoft related products. And Dan Gear was in the company, and he recognized in the early 2000s that Microsoft was pushing out IBM, they were pushing out Nobel, they were pushing out all of these other competitors in the information services space. And rightly so, that was becoming a monoculture. And monocultures are typically bad. When you think about uh, the idea of a monoculture in agriculture, which is where it comes from, if every farmer everywhere grows exactly the same crops, and some fungus comes along, or the bull weevil, or what, whatever it may be, and attacks those crops, it leads to a bad situation, right? You can have uh, food shortages, famine, what have you. So monocultures, I agree with Dan here, monocultures are bad. Um, however, as an incident responder, I would have loved to go into an environment that was actually a monoculture, uh, because what you actually end up with typically are loads of long tails. So this is actually, uh, I was going to live demo this, but I'll, instead I'll just talk to it. This is a, a slide from our demo environment for Tanium, where we've got about 1,300 machines. Fairly small demo environment. 1,300 machines, most of you probably work in environments that are much larger than that. What I've collected here is a list of all running processes across those 1,300 machines, and they're MD5 hashes. And on the uh, far right hand side, there's a count column that aggregates, you know, how many machines is this process running on? And I've sorted it uh, in, in uh, ascending order, right? And you can see the little scroll bar here, this little gray dot, it's almost down to the bottom, and I'm just now getting to the twos. So there are hundreds and hundreds of one-off processes across these 1,300 machines. So when you're an incident responder, if you're chasing outliers, that's what you're looking at, uh, you have a very long tail, unfortunately, to have to go and pursue. And some of you are working in environments with you know, tens of thousands of machines. Office 365, a couple hundred thousand machines. The tail was very, very long. Uh, even in a highly manicured and very well-managed environments, you still have lots of one-offs for whatever reason. And uh, incident response teams have to rabbit hole on all of those things. So, love you, Dan Gear, but I'm still looking to do IR in a real monoculture uh, because then I could go into an environment and the one or two things that are outliers would actually be malicious. So, I have some issues with the outlier thing. The other issue I have with the outlier thing is anybody recognize these two brand logos? So, this is uh, actually Saudi Aramco and Sony Pictures. Uh, here you have the opposite problem of the long tail. You have malware that's present everywhere. So they've dropped code on every machine and they've instructed that code to wipe hard drives. If you're only looking at the long tail, if you're only looking at the outliers for things that are interesting, you're missing those things that are common in the environment that are malicious. So outlier analysis, uh, useful, oversold in my opinion. When you're having to deal with things like this, when you have to work at both the long tail and the big head and review all that data, it's critical that you have automation. So you've got to have automation for data collection, you've got to have automation for analysis, and you want to have some automation for remediation. Another slide I showed here last year. This is us uh, remediating uh, in Office 365. The O365 Red Team did a lot of work up front to build out a nice GUI that they could use to control all of their bots that they would have running in O365. Uh, the details on the slide are not important. The top half of the, of the screen there shows each one of those lines is a host that's calling home to O365 Red Team's command and control in Azure. When those lines are gray, everything is healthy. When those lines start turning this uh, ugly Texas burnt orange like that, it means that those hosts are no longer calling home to their command and control in Azure. And this happened on a day that we were trying to remediate, and one of the O365 Red Team guys took a screenshot of this because he, everything was going offline. He thought maybe it crashed the service. Uh, he had no idea that we were actually doing remediation. Now you'll note there's one line here that's gray. The line that's gray 
is actually one host that we were unable to remediate. We ran our remediation using Kanza, so it's PowerShell over Windows Remote Management, because that's how everything that Microsoft has orchestrated. And uh, if the WinRoom stack on a host is corrupt and you can't connect to the WinRoom stack, then you can't remediate it. So even though we had written this beautiful script that we could run on every endpoint and it could detect you know, if the endpoint was compromised and clean it up, if it couldn't get on the box, then uh, we were out of luck. Which leads to the other part of IR that's common that you should all know is it's a, it's a process. Like security itself, it's not a product, it's a process. So you've got to do the lather, rinse, and repeat business uh, when you're doing security incident response. Even if we had been 100% successful, uh, one of my friends, Jessica Payne, who works for Microsoft, uh, she said this quote in Slack a few weeks ago about valuable targets always staying valuable. And I mostly agree with her. I, there have been some cases where companies have gotten owned and the adversary got exactly what they wanted and they never bothered to come back. Uh, but for the most part, I think she's right. Valuable targets always stay valuable. So just because you kick out one adversary doesn't mean they're not going to try and come back next week or a different adversary is going to come after you. Uh, so IR is definitely a repeat process, uh, a never-ending painful process sometimes. All right, so moving on, uh, who should be doing red team? In my mind, any organization that could have a security incident should be doing red team. Any organization that has something worth protecting should be doing red team. But you've got to have some monitoring, some defensive capabilities, some IR capabilities. If you don't have these three things, you don't have any business doing red team engagements. Um, without these things, you're going to have a very, very bad time. With these things, you're probably going to have a very bad time. So you've got to have these things in play, at least to some extent. Don't wait for them to be good or perfect. They're never going to be good, probably. They're never going to be perfect, certainly. Uh, and red teaming can really help you identify areas of investment for something like this. So who should be doing red teaming? Uh, I originally thought probably an internal team. As I've given this talk uh, in a few different states in the last few months, I've actually sat down with people afterwards, and I've met some uh, pretty fantastic pen testers who are doing red team, blue team engagements as a service. Uh, so I'm a little softer on the probably an internal team, although I still think there's some advantages to having an internal team do this. Uh, a biggie is that uh, in, in Office 365, you have deep subject matter expertise in Exchange. You have deep subject matter expertise in SharePoint, and OneNote, and Skype, or Link, or what have you. You have guys that know that service better than anybody. They've been there for years. Uh, they've seen it grow up. They know how their specific aspect works. None of those guys understand the service end-to-end, -end, as well as the red team. So having an internal team that can break into your services and, and do nasty things that uh, real adversaries may try and do can be a team that you can turn to when you have a real security incident. So I think there's some value in having an internal team uh, do your red team engagements. Now, I get it. A lot of teams, you know, a lot of companies don't have deep pockets. They can't afford to have teams doing this kind of thing. Start small. You know, start with one person. Uh, start with two people. Bring in somebody who's not a member of the security team. Uh, so in the early days of doing this at Microsoft, we brought in experts from Exchange to help the red team figure out how Exchange works. Uh, so bring those people in and, and recruit them as, uh, to, to subsidize the team, basically. This leads to another, when you're dealing with these SMEs, it leads to another lesson learned uh, from my time at Microsoft. You're going to find your documentation is wrong, your code comments are wrong, assumptions are wrong, people are going to look you in the eye and tell you, you know, there's no way that segment of the network is accessible from that segment of the network, it's not configured that way, and they're going to be wrong. Uh, you know, somebody maybe at one point had to migrate a bunch of data from one data center to another, and as a result they opened up a port somewhere that got, they thought would be open for eight hours, it ended up taking a week, and over the week they forgot about it, and things like that fall through the cracks. So. You're, you will find through red teaming uh, all of these things that you think you know or that are documented in a certain way turn out to be incorrect. So red teaming is also very useful for that. Uh, so when should you be doing red teaming? I think probably two to three times a year is sufficient for most organizations. Uh, again, at Microsoft we did this continuously over a four year period. We were constantly red teaming. Some of the engagements uh, went on for months which again, most organizations can probably not afford to do. But when you have uh, 
when you're trying to test every aspect of the service on a regular basis, and you have engagements that are going on for months because it's really hard for the red team to get in and they refuse to give up, uh, and then once they do get in, now you've got the blue team who has to go and do an investigation. And typically, blue team work takes about four times as long as red team work, in my experience. So you can have these engagements that span for months. At Microsoft, we had at one point in time, because of this, we had four concurrent red team engagements going on. Uh, we had a team of like six people on the blue team trying to do incident response against red teamers, four different engagements, and real security incidents that were affecting our customers. So don't do, don't do that. Don't pile up your engagements. Uh, two to three times a year is probably plenty. Uh, so some practicalities of red teaming then. You want to have rules of engagement. In your rules of engagement, make them subject to annual review or biannual review every six months. The team sit down and they hash out what's not working, what is working. Uh, you want to have something in there about how you can get approval from management legal for things that your red team is going to want to do. Eventually, uh, if, if security improves in your organization as a result of red teaming, the red team is going to have a harder and harder time getting into whatever it is they're trying to get into. And they're, they're going to want to do nasty things like this, uh, which the red team at No365 eventually did. Basically what this is, is uh, they're sitting on a mailbox server, and they're saying, give me a list of all the mailboxes and search every one of those mailboxes for password, username, or credential. Now, in most organizations, having a red teamer read employee email is probably not going to go over so well. Um, so you got to have a process where they can get this done. So Microsoft, what they did was they sat down with HR and legal, and they hashed this out. And in the room with HR and legal, they would run the search. And if any matches came back, HR and legal would look at the email and say, OK, this one looks like it's germane. And they would give it to the red team. Real adversaries are going to do this to your company. So you probably want your red team to be able to do this. The other thing, the red team, and they did this after years of doing pen testing. It just got to be really difficult to get in, and so they resorted to things like this. The other thing they resorted to uh, at the end was physical key loggers, uh, which is also something that probably wouldn't fly in most organizations. You are going to want to get approval from, from legal for that. Also in your rules of engagement, uh, no accessing or tampering with customer data. At least no accessing or tampering with real customer data. Uh, O365 and Azure, you can sign up for trial tenants. Uh, you might be able to do this in your organization, set up dummy tenants, uh, and then go hack them all day long so you can get from one dummy tenant to another. No outages, no denial of service attacks. If you're running a billion dollar online business, the last thing you want to do is start losing a bunch of revenue, so don't let your red team uh, cause outages. And don't let the red team weaken security controls. Uh, you don't want a real incident to happen because the red team dropped a firewall rule or something dumb like that. If they can prove that they can do it, you know, if, like here I'm showing you a screenshot of I'm turning off the firewall. If, if they want to take a screenshot of themselves in the firewall management interface showing that, hey, we could have done whatever we wanted, that's fine. But don't actually let them weaken existing security controls. Do give the red team access. Uh, don't make the red team prove that your organization is like all organizations, because you are. You can be fished, you have been fished, you will be fished again. If you want to run a phishing exercise once or twice a year to prove that you're still vulnerable to phishing, that's fine. But let the red team start out with access to the corporate network. That's what we did. All of the Microsoft employees that were on the red team had access to the corporate network. If they could get from the corporate network into the data center, that was a problem. Uh, so let them start out with access. Uh, give them access to source code. Give the red team access to network architecture diagrams. Primarily because it's going to slow them down because these things are always wrong. So let them have that. Make them study that. Keep the blue team in the dark. Don't let the blue team know that there's a red team engagement going on. Okay? You're testing your company's defenses. You're testing the monitoring. You're testing their incident response capabilities. Also, as rules of engagement, don't let the blue team do this. If you're a red team, so the O365 red team, they have this great kit that they wrote. It was a nice bot that they could throw into memory of a running process. And you know, we would dump process memory. We could have extracted that kit and sent it off to virus total, or sent it to the Microsoft AV team, and they could have written signatures for it. Now the red team has to go back and retool. They've got to spend another six months writing tools. That's not what you want the red team doing. You want them owning your business. So don't let your blue team submit the red team kits to Virus Total or any other uh, AV engine. 
That should be against the rules of engagement. Uh, in the rules of engagement, real incidents have to trump red team incidents, right? Red team incidents should be four hours only. Now, if some of you are saying, well, just a couple of slides ago, you said we should keep the blue team in the dark. How do they know they're dealing with a real incident or a red team incident? Um, red teamers are lazy. Pen testers are lazy people by nature, right? They want to write their kit once and they want to use it again and again and again in every engagement. That's fine. Have them do that. When they go to compile their kit, hopefully they're compiling their kit, Hopefully they leave in tool marks. Maybe as the manager of the red team, you tell them to put tool marks in that identify it as red team kit. Your blue team, we got to the point in 0365 where if something nasty was running on a machine, we could get on the machine and in 15 minutes we could say it was the red team. Uh, or we had you know people from China stealing red team tools and running them in the environment, I don't know. Um, so yeah, let these tool marks be there. Your blue team will get to the point where they can identify the tactics, techniques, and procedures, and the kit that belongs to the red team. Hopefully, uh, your mileage may vary. So you know, by that you can do red team four hours plus a little. So Friday night, something happens at 5 p.m. By 5:30, you've got attribution back to the red team, and you pick it back up Monday morning. The other thing you want is somebody on the blue team's management chain has to be in the loop. They have to know there's a red team engagement going on. So for me, this was my boss. He knew that the engagement was happening. He knew enough about it to know that if we respond to an incident, we were responding to a red team engagement or something else. Uh, and so he could divert us from, you know, say, oh, we're working on something where we know they, they were able to dump credentials from the domain controller, but now I've got this small customer of 200 employees that you're wanting me to go and assist. This thing, you know, this domain admin compromise seems much worse, but you're telling me to go work with this small company that's a customer on a security incident. Blue team figures out, okay, this is a red team engagement. So somebody somebody has to be in the loop, but play these things as, as best you can, right? Uh, use this for cross-team cross collaboration. I talked about that a little bit. You're gonna want your communications people involved. You're gonna want subject matter experts from across the company involved. Uh, helping the blue team out because the blue team's not going to know, hey, is this ASPX file sitting on this web server normal? Uh, you're probably not going to know that as the blue team. You've got to loop in other people. Establish a situation room, uh, at the very least a phone bridge, and then run it like you would any normal security incident, right? Designate leads, uh, delegate PM, run your investigation, document your findings, report your findings. Nobody likes report writing. Uh, investigate for show, report for demo. All the while that you're running your investigation, you should be planning for remediation. You want to carry this thing end to end, right? The blue team should exercise remediation. Um, I'll talk about some things off the mic about remediation, uh, but build out a plan for how you're going to remediate this thing and execute remediation. You've got to, that's the most critical thing that the blue team is hired for. You want these people exercising remediation. And then you go into post remediation monitoring, which is where you go back and look again. What did we miss? What did we know about that we didn't clean up? Uh, what fell through the cracks? Was there a machine that where WinRM wasn't responding and we couldn't clean up? So that's the uh, post-remediation monitoring. And then you get to the most critical aspect of the entire exercise, which is the post uh, Also the most fun and the most interesting aspect of the whole thing. Who goes to the post -mortem? The stakeholders. So in the case of Office 365, the exchange team or the SharePoint team or what have you. Uh, the blue team goes and the red team goes. It's not about blame games. You're not going to go there and point fingers and say the network team's stupid. They left this configuration in place that they shouldn't have. It's not about blame games, but do hold yourself accountable. Like I showed, uh, showed a slide earlier of WMI event consumer data that we collected. We collected that data. I collected that data, and we sat on it for a week. I sat on it for a week. We didn't even look at it. Uh, so there was an event consumer sitting out there for a week that uh, we had the data for. We could have known if we looked at it. Uh, so when you go into the post mortem, these are things you talk about. Hey, we collected this data. We didn't look at it for a week. Here's what we're going to do in the future. We're going to add functionality to automate analysis so we find out about these things right away. Uh, so do hold yourself accountable. I like for the blue team to go first in the post mortem because everybody loves a good story, and the blue team is going to tell a nice story. Uh, it's going to be you know, story time with the blue team. They're going to tell what they think happened in the environment. All cards on the table. It's really tempting as a blue teamer when you share your secret sauce with the red team and they go, oh, we're going to screw you next time. We're not going to register the DLL in the process. We're just going to inject it and you'll never see it again. 
it's really tempting in the next next postmortem to not put all the cards on the table because you got burned by them last time, but put all the cards on the table because it will force you to get better. The red team is going to go second. The red team is going to tell the factual account of what actually happened. You've had the story time with the blue team, now the red team's really going to lay into you and tell you what happened and all the things you missed. There's going to be a nice gap between the blue team story and the red team story. The goal for the blue team is next engagement, let's close that gap as much as we can. Hopefully, after doing this exercise, you can come in and the blue team story is just as good as the red team story. The red team obviously wants to widen that gap during the next incident if they can, or at least uh, keep it from narrowing at all. All teams, stakeholders, red team, blue team, they're all going to get bugs to take away from this process. Red team's going to get bugs. How do we inject DLLs without registering them in the process? Blue team's going to get bugs. How do we find things that we've missed this time? And the stakeholders are going to get bugs. Hey, we had nasty SQL injection. We've got to go fix that. Uh, so that's the post-mortem. And finally, some, fa uh, some last lessons learned. Some of these are going to be pretty obvious. Uh, one of the things that uh, we learned, uh, it, which, you know, we've all known this for a long time, nobody runs as admin. In 0365, nobody running as admin meant that we had to develop something called JIT, uh, or just-in-time admin. Uh, I heard a rumor that this is going to ship in 2016, server 2016. I haven't looked. Uh, I think server 2016 is available for, for download or purchase now. You might look and see if it's in there. Basically, if somebody, if a, an operator in O365 wanted to get into the data center and do something on uh, a machine in the data center, they had to go through a portal, require two-factor authentication, they had to say what access level they needed. We had a, a matrix of like 15 different administrative account roles that you could do different things with. So very, very granular uh, administration level. They would apply for the level of access, their manager would have to approve it. Again, the manager logs in, two factors. Uh, then the user gets an email back saying, hey, your request has been approved. Here's your temporary credential, dynamically generated. It's good for four hours. At the end of the four hours, it's gone. Uh, eight hours, I think, was the max, but four hours was pretty typical. Another thing we did was dedicated admin workstations. You don't want your users that are managing a billion dollar service to be managing it from a machine that they check email or browse the web from. Uh, so we had dedicated admin workstations, a separate physical workstation that they had to use to get into the data center. They hated it uh, because it's painful. You want to be able to download tools from the internet and go run them in the data center, right? Uh, so having this physical separation, uh, there was a lot of pushback on this. Uh, but it was it was important, so we made it happen. Uh, get away from human generated passwords. Humans are a terrible source of entropy. Everybody had to run a password safe. Everybody had to use password safe generated passwords. I recommend you don't use password safes that store your data in the cloud, but that's just me. Uh, two factor authentication everywhere, and don't trust but verify. Things are going to fall through the cracks over time. People are going to misconfigure things, and they're going to sit there for months. Uh, I think. Probably once or twice, we didn't do this, but I think it's probably worth doing. Take a week or two every six months as a blue team and just say, hey, let's go review all router configurations. Let's go review all firewall configurations. Let's go review all the service accounts and the domain controllers and make sure everything is what we expect it to be. Uh, so that's probably a good practice. Not something that we did, but uh, probably something we should have done. And finally, uh, in conclusion, red teaming is hard. Real incidents are going to be harder. So practice how you want to play. Any questions? I will repeat the question. So the question was, uh, is there something you can do to warm up the blue team uh, so they don't pucker when the real security or when a red team security incident kicks off and your red team, your blue team, maybe they're inexperienced, how do you keep them from going into panic mode? Um, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, it's not supposed to be adversarial. So that's that's one thing, like when I was talking to people in the industry about this, they're like, well, you're talking about adversarial, you're adversarial with the red team? 
yeah, professionally adversarial. Like, uh, we had lunch with the red team every day, which also made it fun because we could socially engineer them at lunch. We could try and, you know, some of those guys have no poker face. Uh, so you can ask them questions when, the, when they turn red or whatever, you get, you get some intel that you couldn't otherwise get. Um, yeah, how do you, a lot of organizations start out with maybe a tabletop exercise. If you're not ready for a full-on red team, blue team engagement, maybe you start out with a tabletop exercise where you just throw out hypotheticals. Okay, we have evidence that Mimi Katz was run on a domain controller, what do we do? What's the incident response plan and how do we attack it? So maybe you start with tabletop. I have a question. I don't know if you can answer it. Was uh, att attacking a developer's computer and hoping and waiting for the code to be rolled in production in scope? So uh, Alex's question is: Was attacking a developer's computer and waiting for the code to roll into production in scope? Burn it all down scenario. So in O365, in, in uh, the the service is being rebuilt. It's kind of like a skin. You know, your epidermis every 22 days or whatever it is completely replaced. I don't know if that's factual. So, but in O365, basically every 30 days, the entire service is rolled. Every machine, every 30 days is re-imaged. So there's obviously a nice build process that's constantly churning. The build servers were in scope. If the red team could push code via a developer's machine to a build server and get it into the environment, and then 30 days later it was on every machine, that was certainly in scope. They never actually did that at that scale. They did it at a smaller scale. Uh, because O365 is broken up into multiple services, so maybe they attacked one service and pulled that off. But yeah, developer machines were certainly in scope for O365 Red Team. Yeah. Pretty much anything a, uh, a real attacker would do with the Red Team was fair game. Thanks.